Hello everyone, welcome back to Weaving Web3. I have two amazing guests for you. I have Tara from Institutional Staking, and we also have Erica, a, a world leading author in crypto crime. <laughs> um, so, could you just introduce yourselves a bit more and tell me what got you into crypto and where you are now? Right. Um, I'll go first. So I uh, work for an institutional staking company, as you mentioned. Um, previous to that was four years in Elliptic, the world of crypto compliance, fighting off the bad guys. Uh, and then before that, a whole host of other crypto startups. Uh, but I started in TradFi, and that was really the catalyst for me coming into crypto, is seeing the way that the traditional banking system works, um, but reading about this kind of brave new world of Bitcoin and how it can make everything different. Um, Amazing. Cool. So I'm Erica Stanford. I wrote the book Crypto Wars, so Crypto Wars, Fake Deaths, Missing Billions and Industry Disruption. Uh, I work at a law firm, so the main law firm in the space, CMS. So we've got about 300 companies in the crypto space as, as clients. And I started and run the main uh, crypto community in the UK, the Crypto Curry Club. Ah, awesome. So let's get started. For me, the biggest barrier in crypto is everyone thinks it's a scam. Um, everyone's getting rugged, people are losing money. So where does cybercrime come into it? How can we protect the next users coming to want to explore this? Yeah, sure. I mean, so there's a few things. So first of all, it's if anyone is in crypto, the first thing is where you store your crypto, how you hold your crypto. There's different ways of storing crypto. Some are safer than others. And, and as we've seen recently, some of the centralized exchanges that go out of the way to market as being extra safe and so forth and trustworthy are actually some of the most dangerous places to store crypto because the problem is and you're sending your money into a centralized pot absolutely and e a they're very prone to being hacked so that's a big problem but then also there's been numerous cases of the founders of the exchange going thank you very much for your money i'll help myself to that so ftx is just the most recent big case of that but there's been so 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 many cases of founders of centralized platforms helping themselves to the, the central pot. So where you store your crypto is is the key starting block. And there are safer solutions such as like offline hard wallets and, and custody solutions. And then the other thing is crypto, the way it works is if you send a crypto transaction, you can't just call up and go, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to send you a yeah, transaction. Can send you it. send it back, please? There's no undo button. Once you've sent your crypto, it's bye-bye crypto and scams pay on this. So you've got all sorts of scams that uh, they have different facades. Some of them are, there's all sorts of different scams, but some of them will say, oh, you'll get a discount if you do this. Some will say, oh, you'll get free coins if you do this. Some will say you've got cheaper custody if you do this. Some will say you've got access to so-and-so or you'll double your money. Or There's all these different offers that they that they offer, but at their core, what they're trying to do is get you to part with your money. So they might be that type of scam. They might be romance scams. They might be phishing links. Mm. Just trying to, <coughs> excuse me, trying to imitate a website. And some of them will imitate websites so well that you genuinely can't see mm. the difference between the real website and the fake website or the real app and the fake app. So they'll do anything to get you to part with your crypto, either by clicking on a phishing yeah. link sort of without knowing or by tricking you into sending crypto to something else. And then, of course, once they've got your crypto, you really can't do very much. And, of course, it's possible to go through a court order, but then that costs so much and takes so long. The chance of getting your crypto back is still low and that costs a lot of money, so then not everyone wants to do that. Yeah. And I think this is the challenge. Like Everything Erica just mentioned is pretty like technical for a non-crypto person, yeah. right? Like if you think about the different hardware <coughs> you could buy to store your crypto, the different options of even of where to, to store it, all of those different scam types. And it's often too hard to use them as well. It's, yeah, it's super hard to use. And when you say to the average person, like, oh, here, you know, watch out for being rugged. And they go, yeah. firstly, what is that? What are the signs? Mm. And so I think that is one of the biggest reasons that we have so many scams in the space is it's a lot of information 
for a new user to try and be aware of, to know the red flags of. And that's exactly what the criminals do. They're trying to play on the fact that new people into the space just don't know what to look yeah, out for from a risk perspective. For sure. Do you also think, because we get taught about scams like in traditional finance, like when you get a, your banking message that's very suspicious, you're like, okay, maybe I'm not going to reply to that. But do you think because it's crypto and everyone's so excited about it, they just kind of lose their sense? Because like, for sure, like I, w- I would not reply to these text messages, but because some random person on crypto said they're going to double my money, it's like, this is, must be true. And I think that psychology and the, the, the adrenaline that you get from crypto, you basically lose your senses. Exactly. And if you think of, um, so Erica just mentioned it before, these scams, which are like, oh, we'll make you a millionaire, basically. Now, if someone comes to you in the traditional finance world and says, I'm going to make you a millionaire, give me £10 a month, you'd be like, obviously not, that's a scam. In crypto, the problem is some people have become millionaires (laughs) from investing really small amounts of money. And so people think, oh, well, it is possible in crypto. So what would be a scam in TradFi isn't necessarily always a scam in crypto. Very often is. And I think that means that people are more susceptible to falling for Mm. scams because there isn't an easy play-by-play of like 100% a scam, 100% not. Exactly as Erica was saying, you know, you've got all these phishing sites that look legit, but they aren't actually. So the scammers in crypto really try and play on the fact that you can become a millionaire in crypto Mm. sometimes. And and I mean, that is one of uh, some of them. A lot of people would look at it and go, this is clearly a Ponzi scheme. But then there are so many that, that just you wouldn't know really it's a scam and and what some of them do they'll have a website that looks incredibly real Mm. but then they'll go further they'll put people on on their board or on their team or on their advisors that that are real people they'll make all of these claims they'll say oh we partnered with such and such companies we've got such and such companies as customers i'll show the logos we're regulated by such and such government they'll do all of these tricks there was even a company bought another company that was regulated and say hey you know go on the fca website you can see that we're we're, we're real, we're, we're regulated by the FCA. I've been used to promote scams mm, really? and, and, and loads of people have in the space and you, you find it out only later, somebody will send it to you and go, did you know your face is on this wow. project? And it's like, no, no, I didn't And know. that could tarnish your reputation but, later and it down the line. happens all the time because they're not concerned, obviously, about playing by the rules. So you've got these projects that make themselves look really good and all of their claims sound really good and you think, wow, you, you know, they've got all of these people on their team, they've got all these people as their customers, it must be good, it must be real. And it's it's just all a lie. So I think people just have to be extra, extra cautious and and, and there's that problem where it comes like trustless and trust. Just don't trust crypto. anything. Yeah. yeah. That's <laughs> the thing. And like we're meant to like it's meant to crypto's meant to empower us to create our own applications and like be our own like founders and like own our own projects. But at the same time anyone can do it and, and there's a scam will just pop out any moment. And I feel like for me, I'm, it's a bit controversial, but I am for a bit of centralization within the whole crypto to like, let's say regulated uh, bodies that will potentially protect those getting into DeFi, like the uh, Web3 2.5 that could have that set regulated person that could ease us into crypto. Is that something you think or is so that the, against? The problem is that let's take the biggest you know, market event happening right now, FTX. Yeah. FTX was centralized, like I say. They were regulated. Mm-hmm. They were regulated but in the Bahamas. They were going around the world talking to politicians. They said their custody yeah. was like super secure. They probably had all sorts of, you know, SOC two, ISO twenty seven thousand one security audits. They had some really amazing developers. They had a board with lots of eminent people. Exactly as you were saying, like on paper they looked fine. Under the hood, it's all totally different board game. And so that's one of the challenges. Is like and they paid a lot of money to yeah. a lot of their regulators and politicians, millions, millions, yeah. millions. Which is the not Exa- shady side. Exactly. That. And so I think that the challenge is like centralization by itself isn't good or bad. Oh, Decentralization absolutely. by itself isn't good or bad. There are a lot of bad actors who yeah. are in crypto who will always get around whatever we put in mm. place. But I think when it comes down to potential kind of impacts of it one of the challenges with ftx is it's now going through the bankruptcy courts people have their money locked and they can't get out when you look at some of the decentralized platforms where things have gone wrong Mm -hmm. even through bad management whether it was through market events 
liquidations on chain meant that people got hold of their funds a lot quicker. So there's kind of the good of centralization yeah, if it's done sure. well, but there's also actually the good of decentralization oh, absolutely. if it's done well when things go badly. And I think more and more people aren't necessarily trusting the centralized model, partly because in crypto there's been so many colossal problems, but that's just not limited to crypto. Yeah. Uh, there's been a lot of problems with the traditional banking oh, system, the with, bank with traditional centralized companies where you really can't trust people and, and part of the benefit of, of crypto and part of the sort of the initial draw and also of decentralization is that you shouldn't have to trust anybody you yeah. should just be able to have your money in a pot that only you can access and that nobody else can access or get away from you and i think more and more the more governments are trying to control everything as we're seeing more and more cbdc's yeah i don't know that one can really trust anyone or anything on a centralized platform so yes i do see your argument that it would be better but i think in the ideal world if regulation worked perfectly if governments were honest and weren't utterly corrupt i i, I think in the perfect world then yes that would be ideal but we don't live in a perfect world one really can't trust many actors so in terms of safety for individual users, if done correctly, yeah. I would argue that decentralization offers a lot more safety for individual users. I really like that. It, it, it's, it's nice that we can have like a conversation, even we don't necessarily agree each other, but I, I do see your point. I, do, I wish we could live in this ideal world, but the people that run this country will, ne I feel like, won't allow us to have our full Well, they don't. The people that run countries don't have the same interests at heart as individuals yeah. who are trying to get on with life. Yeah, that's true. Hmm. Okay, well, I, I really appreciate you telling me, because now, now I'm confusing myself in my head. Like, actually, you are right, and I should have a bit larger thought about that. So I wanted to just slightly move on to... A, like a kind of like a passion project for mine. Like I love zero knowledge. I really care about my privacy. And in related to crime, how can will that impact? Because we had seen like people using tornado cash. I I wanted to test out Aztec, so I um, I used the protocol. I had uh, my money in zk land, and then when I withdrew it to a fresh wallet, supposedly it is untraceable and clean money. And so, how would that work in like? tracking because i obviously i'm not gonna do anything nefarious with that thing but with the money that i have on this fresh wallet but it's untraceable to me so what are the implications for cyber crime now so i can uh, happily talk all things crypto compliance and uh, crypto tracing with my background um so i think it there's, there isn't this kind of homogenous group when it comes to privacy coins or privacy services so if we take tornado cash as a yeah. really good example so Tornado Cash basically allows you to kind of pool all of your money, mix it all up, you have to take it out, you can't uh, match up your deposits and the withdrawals. Now, what you can though do is tell when someone is either putting money into Tornado mm -hmm. Cash or out. And so if you think about crypto compliance, and essentially that's making sure people aren't doing dodgy stuff, Yeah. what you can at least say is if someone has interacted with a privacy service. Now that might not mean you need to not provide services to them if you're an exchange, for instance. It maybe gives you a little bit of heightened risk. Yeah. Now, when you consider sanctioned actors like the Lazarus Group, who are pretty heavy users of Tornado Cash and were you know, the reason it got sanctioned, yeah. that doesn't mean that their activity was hidden from the world because they were using Tornado Cash. In many cases, you can do pattern analysis of funds coming into Tornado Cash, certainly big volumes coming in and then a big volume coming out. Hmm, how good that be? Um, or if you move funds too quickly in and out, yeah. then you can do a lot of connections. So just because someone uses a privacy irritated service doesn't mean the trail is dead. In fact, if you think of companies like Elliptic, like they are able with the technology they have to get a lot of insight about on-chain activity happening by criminals. And so privacy tech, privacy coins aren't this like utopia for criminals mm -hmm. where they can never be found. Um, you, you can trace a lot of this activity. And I think the biggest thing to know in all of this is bad actors need to be able to cash out eventually. Yeah, they have to try and use some kind of centralized service like an exchange, which allows them to convert to fiat. Now, you can see, you know, the way back if they've used a privacy coin, maybe they've tried to do a cross-chain swap to throw you off the scent. You can see that on chain, like you can see it in elliptic, for instance. <laughs> so they can't get away with bad activity. And I think 
that's really important to say because it means that we shouldn't demonize privacy tech and say like, oh, it should be banned because criminals use it to hide. Privacy is really important. Absolutely. Like if I said, show me your bank account now, you're probably going to be like, no. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're doing anything dodgy in there, but like yeah. privacy is normal. We shouldn't have to like reveal all of our on-chain activity. And so I think it's really important to balance the fact that with on-chain analytics, you can stop criminals using crypto from exploiting privacy-orientated technology while still allowing people to use privacy-orientated technology to donate to Ukraine yeah. or hide their salary information or hide their trading activity if they're a crypto celeb and they don't want people copy trading them. Privacy is really important. Privacy tech is really important. And you can absolutely balance that with crypto yeah. compliance and not allowing bad actors to do bad things. I think there's a few things to add to that. I mean, just one of the statistics I heard, I think called CypherTrace, that they can track at least 65% of all Monero transactions. And that's what, what is a bit to But I think that there's two points to that. As, as Tara says, privacy is massively important. It might just be that you just want to be private but we live in london yeah. we've got life relatively good here there's so many countries around the world where you can't live freely where you can't buy the religious textbook that you want yeah. where you can't join whatever group that you want where you can't access what we would consider basic human rights where you just don't have those freedoms because of of the government or the rule or whatever where things like being able to buy things with private crypto transactions mm -hmm. yeah. means that you can that's the only way that people can access some basic human rights yeah. so it might be to buy a religious book it might be to flee a country it might be whistleblowers making payments it mm -hmm. might be all sorts of things that as a relatively privileged person sitting in central London, we can't even comprehend the, the need for. So there's so many reasons why the ability to be able to make private transactions, I would consider as an essential human right. Absolutely. And the more and more governments try and entrench themselves in life and see everything, especially as things are going with digital pounds and CPCs, yeah. that, that's getting more and more important. So I don't think one can say at all that just because somebody's wanted to do something private, that means something bad. No, not, not at all. There's a million reasons, as, as you said, that that, that that can be. And then another trend that we're seeing is even without the privacy coin. So one of the factors of, uh, of, of crypto is that it can be hard to cash out mm. illegally gained crypto and and so hence people have tried to go for the privacy tools but what we're now seeing is the getaways around that north korean hackers have entire teams of people going to casinos in macau mm. gambling to to launder that money That's and there's entire marketplaces on the dark web where people basically sell their services to be used as 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 people to cash out money so it might be that they let them use their names or their addresses mm -hmm. or that they even have a, a like a rent a person service wow. where people in mostly in the developing world who really don't have enough way of making money where they're basically used for a relatively small fee to cash out that money so the the privacy coin thing or the the mixes is really a small part of the argument i yeah. I, I would argue that if anyone wants to cash out illegally gain crypto or illegally gain anything there's ways to do that and even if you make privacy coins impossible to access you make mixes impossible to access then there's plenty of people who will be paid because they need that money to, to, to use wow. it. So there's always getaways, get, get arounds. And I think per, just as a personal moral stance, banning mixers and banning privacy mm -hmm. is, is incredibly dangerous for human rights yeah. and freedom and, and incredibly bad practice and just doesn't solve the problem at all. Wow. I think there's, it's also worth it. So we've talked about the really important like human need for privacy. And I think everything you said is just like so spot on. The other side of needing privacy, which is not the kind of the human rights angle at all, it's the money making angle, it's for institutions, yeah. right? So I come from the world of institutional staking. When you're an institution, you do not want all of your trade activity visible to Absolutely. all. Absolutely. It's why we have dark pools in the traditional finance world. It's why you have bilateral trades happening. It's why you have OTC trading. Like privacy in the traditional market is really important and really useful. If you're a big company, you, you publish your accounts once a year, but you don't have them open, you mm -hmm. don't have your bank accounts open yeah. for everyone to see. 
And so if we want to start bringing more institutions into the space, we have to allow them privacy to do the trades Absolutely. that they want to do. So there's both the, I think you're so right, like the moral need for privacy on chain for everyone that isn't living a privileged life in a privileged country. But even for those living a privileged life in a privileged country, mm -hmm. trying to make a load of institutional trades, they also want privacy. Yeah. And so I think that's also why it's just a non-negotiable, everyone needs and wants it, or maybe not like everyone, everyone, but like the vast majority need there is and a want need. it yeah. for all sorts of different reasons. Wow. I honestly, listening to you for the last five minutes, my brain has just like kind of like exploded because <laughs> like I didn't know certain things about all the dark wave you just mentioned, and like it's shocking that yeah, it's sorry, I was just I don't know what to think about, but it's it's a bit scary that people can do that, and sorry. Well, I mean, just just one factor to for it, and so you just mentioned the dark web. About fifty percent of everything on the dark web is not a legal thing. So you've got on dark web, you've got all the dark, the marketplaces selling drugs and guns and porn yeah. and, and everything. And then 50% is things like libraries, where you yeah. can read any book for free, where you can read the Bible for free, that's where amazing. you can access newspapers, where you can contact the CIA if, if that's what you want. And but where there's just this whole need for this web infrastructure that people in certain countries just can't access so i think that makes a massive yeah. massive point and that is a of, right of how much there is that people just really can't access on the normal web or via traditional payment systems and you're so right it's because we're in a in london we completely take it for granted mm -hmm. that we can access any part of the internet we want I have a friend that lived in China for, I think it was about two years, and she said one of the biggest things that hit her when she got there, she tried to like effectively Google some stuff and nothing came up. Wow. Like yeah. if you Google Tibet, for instance, in mainland China, at least when she did, her internet got shut off. Oh, wow. Like her internet stopped working because she Googled a very taboo word. Now again, like we can't really almost like imagine that here where we have no. access to all these information. What well, Zarek was saying, like some of the information on the dark web is, is just information you can't access if you live in a country that's putting walls around the internet. If you're in, you know, Afghanistan right now as a woman, you cannot access education. Like you can't. Like, there's no way you can go for education. So of course they're going to use VPNs, get on the dark web to access like GCSE material. And, and if they have to pay, they have to pay in crypto. crypto. Yeah, because they're not allowed bank accounts. Their finances are put shut off. Like. Even I think it was, um, who was it? I think UNICEF or someone like that, um, or the Red Cross was doing a project in Afghanistan trying to figure out ways to get crypto to women because they weren't able to access bank accounts. And so being able to offer them crypto allowed them to trade, to pay, to buy services and information online. Like it really is a lifeline for many people, both the dark web and crypto. But it is often, as you, your first question, just demonized with like yeah. scams and, you know, crypto used by, you know, Andrew Tay and all the rug pulls and just like in North Korea, yeah. all that like Which bad stuff. Which is only stuff. really a small percentage. Such yeah. a small yeah. And to, to the point that Tara is making, if you look at the, the countries that use crypto the most, the biggest uses mm. of crypto, it isn't the developed no. countries mm -hmm. where you have freedom and where you have good human rights. Yeah. It's it's countries like like Venezuela, yeah. like Argentina, like, El like the Ukraine, mm -hmm. like El Salvador. It's, it, it's countries where people basically have no other choice, where it's a lifeline. And the the thing about crypto, uh, what upsets me a little bit about it here, people just talk about oh, price of Bitcoin go up, Elon Musk tweets, mm. price of Dogecoin or whatever coin goes up or down, and really that doesn't matter for. So many people, yes, is it volatile? Yes. Is it much less volatile than national currencies where you've got hyperinflation? Yes. And, you know, the whole thing about crypto, it can be so demonized, but really there's a lot of people that literally depend yeah. on it. Would they want to depend on it? No. Do they choose to depend on it? No. Have yeah. they got any other viable choice? No. And these aren't the rich people that can afford to buy their way out or bribe their way out. Yeah. Yeah. Like remittance is such a good example of this. So you will pay, you know, six to twelve percent to send funds to, like, let's say you've got some family in the Philippines. Yeah. You use up money for thirty percent. Up to thirty. Like it's crazy high yeah. that's been taken off. Now you're working super hard for that money. You're sending it back to your relatives for like education, food, housing, medicine, like really important stuff 
Nato and Bitcoin or Ether, you are paying Nothing. pennies yeah. to That's send what happened with my And dad. this is people that might earn a dollar a day or yeah. a few yeah. dollars a day. It's not. Every penny counts. Exactly. exactly. And it can be the difference between feed a kid or get yeah. a kid to school. And again, like, we don't think about that in our privileged position in London. You know, we might buy some Ether with Revolu and, oh, isn't yeah. that fun? Or buy a little NFT, whatever. But we don't need it. We don't need no, it. No, we don't. For some people, it's like a genuine, like, life-changing experience because they can keep up to 30% more of their money that they're working hard for. And I think, yeah, Or again, they can send their transaction because in some yeah. countries, governments yeah. block transactions going abroad yeah. or going out of the currency and, yeah. and so forth. So it means in some cases they can even send that money to their families. Yeah, like if you don't have government-issued identity in so many places, you can't get a bank account, you can't open any kind of like financial services. That's a third of the world's population. Yeah. And you don't need an ID wow. for a Bitcoin address. You don't, do you? And that, I mean, that's in a massive argument. There's so much talk about the need for KYC. And, and, and all of that, I mean, A... There's so many reasons why it can be bypassed because of, of people who will do it for money, or because of how AI and fakes. And so there's a million arguments against KYC, but the more demands for it, then you can either have KYC or you can have people getting access to finance. Yeah. You can't have both by core definition. That, wow. This has probably been one of the most inspiring talks I've <laughs> listened to. Like, I, I, I have been open so much in like, what you've said about the whole just access to those who do not in these countries that can't have it crypto needs to be pushed to them more than actually we need it and i think from here i would just ask us last thing is where do you think we will see the blockchain technology in the next year what will be like the biggest impactful vision good or bad <laughs> um, there will definitely be more crime I think that's like the one prediction I'm always happy to make because it's always going to be I need, the, I need the, the photo for my next <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true, yeah. there will be more crime so buy Echo's book um, but I think what we're hopefully going to get alongside that because people have been burnt like you come across now people all the time who really sadly lost money in FTX, mm. Celsius Firaz Capital like you know everyone pick your absolutely I've met many people what I think is the only good part of that is those people have now learned how to be safer in crypto. We're weeding out bad actors. People are hopefully getting kind of educated, more aware yeah. and educated. And with that comes some really exciting stuff is that they become a bit more passionate about mm -hmm. the industry and fighting off the bad guys. <laughs> they understand the tech a little bit better. And often the really cool conversations I have with people is someone that's like deeply passionate about what they do, which isn't crypto related, and me, who's manic obsessive about crypto and then you come together and you're like oh what if we use crypto to do this and a good example was a friend of mine who was really deep in human rights anti-human trafficking and she was like super passionate about that i'm obsessed with crypto and obviously i told it all about crypto she told me more than i think i would ever want to know about <laughs> horrific things happening in that world and then she was like oh what if you could use the blockchain as an immutable store for contracts of workers that are massively exploited by the fact someone just changes the contract or takes it away and that now was rolled out and wow. i think she worked with the un um, and like interpol uh, or europol to roll that out across thailand like all sorts of apac based countries where workers have their contracts essentially rugged from them and so i'm really excited by the fact that you're going to get a load of people in this industry who are going to draw these like crazy connections other parts of the world and industries and figure out how to use blockchain in ways that none of us can envisage right now in the same way that we've got like deliveroo no yeah. one could have thought of that in the 90s <laughs> that's bonkers but someone with deep like internet knowledge came together with a restaurant and boom that came out so i think there's going to be some really exciting that's stuff. amazing wow is there anything on you yeah i mean everything that Cara says is great, <laughs> but it always is I, I think what what i'd like to see and i, I don't know maybe this is me being optimistic is the focus being taken away from the price goes up price goes down mm -hmm. and the scams are so moving because there's so many use cases of crypto just i mean there's, there's so many Micropayments, be that micro loans, be that micro insurance, be that wages, be that remittances. You've got the paying per use concept because with crypto, there's no effective cost to send a transaction. So it could be, well, I pay 1p to listen to this podcast, I pay 2p to read that article, I pay a pound to read that chapter, yeah. whatever that is digitally. I pay 2p because I liked your post on whatever, LinkedIn or something. But there's all these 
potential use cases, be that loyalty fees, be that incentive payments, be that rewards, whatever, but you, we can have with digital currency. And then you've got the whole royalty thing for artists and content creators who really don't stand, don't know currently what they're being paid, where that's coming from, are they being treated honestly? They basically have to go on trust and, and go blindly, whereas with blockchain and crypto payments, they can get in live time just bought my digital book, great, I've got that money now, and I can see I've got that money now. So there's so many potential use cases. That's really just touching on the surface of the use cases. So I guess my hope is that the industry matures enough and enough companies from other spaces, just like what Tara said, get in and use not so much crypto, and it doesn't even have to be the, the, the ones that we have now. Bitcoin has its values for uh, as a store of value and, and many other things. That's not to say that Bitcoin would be the best tool for these purposes or or, all the ones around now. But the the point is you've got this technology that allows you to send micropayments for Mm -hmm. free, that allows you to send micropayments cross-border or large payments cross-border. You've got all of this potential that could be used a lot more in the real world than it is now. So I think what I'd like to see is not have it limited to the crypto markets and not have it limited to this tiny little ecosystem that is really so in some ways so naive and so irrelevant because there's so much more potential to it. Wow. My uh, my entire brain and energy is ready to restart to be more optimistic <laughs> crypto. I've definitely got to get your book and crypto and wars. Tyrus. And your book. You got a book as well? Yeah, the Bitcoin ABC book. Okay, so well, read mine to start. And then once you understand the basics, you can go to Eric's book. Well, perfect. That's what, that's what I'm going to do. And I really hope you enjoyed this interview, everyone. And... I don't know. I'm speechless. This is I, this, this never happens. But like I, 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 my world has been opened again. And thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. For uh, I hope you have an amazing day. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Cool. Wow.